thing. And so without going too far into detail with proof of life, the short of it is get the other side to state your value proposition for you. And the reality is it sounds very manipulative, right? There's a, there's a fine line between influence and manipulation. The reality is intent. And it sounds very manipulative. The reality is if someone spends several minutes explaining to you how wonderful you are, and how great it would be to do business with you and your entity. It's very, very difficult for them to follow that up with, but we can't pay your price, right? Those, those two ideas are too far apart. How can you tell us how wonderful we are and how great it is to work for us and how much it's gonna help your company and what you're doing and follow that up with, well, there's too much money or that's not enough money, right? That's, it's very hard for human beings to make that connection. It really feeds to the sequence. But the real first step to breaking the traditional bargaining chain is to not respond with numbers, right? The typical haggling sequence, a lot of us are here because how do we get out of that sequence? How do we break that sequence? The first step is when they give you a number, you do not respond with another number. This is one of the few places where I would probably say never, ever, ever respond with a number. If you're truly trying to break the process and get outside and get them to bid against themselves, which is where we're going to end up in our final class. That's really the first step to it. Another thing that I wanted to throw in is Christopher with us today. I wanted to get a chance to just address a couple of things that you brought up in the, in the last class. Got a chance to listen to a recording, obviously. And I think it's an issue that a lot of us deal with, whether we're the ones doing it or we're having it done to us. But this idea of, you know, you always want to get the most for yourself. But at the same time, you want them to feel treated fairly. First things first, I love the intention behind it in that wanting to make the other side feel like they made a good deal too. Right. As you know, I mean, what's, what's leading that is if, they feel like it, they, they got taken advantage of or they made a bad deal for themselves, the implementation of that deal in the long run is probably gonna leave a lot to be desired, right? Unfortunately, when we, when we beat people down to their socks, one way for them to get back at us is when the implementation goes down the drain. And so I love the sentiment there in general. The one slight tweak that I would make to that just in, in its raw format actually really speaks to a class that Troy is teaching called Caviar, which is all about mindset. And so it's really, really subtle. But when we go from thinking, how do I get the best deal for myself and change that to how do we make the best deal for us? That's a simple enough mindset shift and, and, a, and a slight enough tweak in the focus that now the intention really becomes more about us rather than what do I do for me? And then as I'm getting everything I need, how do I kind of fix and make them whole at the same time, right? Instead of making it two separate pieces, you, you attack it much more holistically and it's just simple mindset shift. And even more so adding that in to some degree as you set the stage with your accusations audit, to, uh, to the tune of, I know it's important for us to make a deal that makes everybody better. Adding that as your intro to set the stage is, is some of the way to inject that into the environment as it were. But uh, Derek, one of our other great uh, instructors and, and success coaches, and he's been with Black Swan for a long time. He was, he recently purchased a home, bought a piece of land out there, had a house built. Now he went into that negotiation with the Ackerman technique. He used that to leave no meat on the bone for this contractor that he was dealing with. I mean, he got, he got every last cent that he possibly could and for all intents and purposes made the very best deal for himself when it comes to the economics and the dollars as, 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 as could be made, right? I don't think he could have done any better from that regard. In short, Derek's house got finished 
almost a year later than expected. And so, yeah, up front, right? He got that win of every single, every last cent, but he beat the contractor down so badly, right? This contractor's got a lot of jobs going on, as many contractors do, as many companies do, right? Dealing with different clients, entities, vendors, what have you. And when it comes to prioritizing in the long term, it's very easy to prioritize the jobs you're making money on and very easy to let the others fall by the wayside. And so Derek kind of found out the hard way, right? Beating him down to his socks actually caused like an eight month delay in the house getting built. And they went through periods of time when they couldn't get this guy on the phone, right? For all they knew, he jumped on an international flight and left the country. And so, you know, to your point, Christopher, and, and it's why I love that you brought this up because that is such a delicate, fine line to play. And so a couple of things I'll add to that. When you know you're pushing someone too far, they have a tendency to get really angry or start to slowly withdraw. And Right, I'm not speaking specifically like when we're dealing with the assertive type that's overly aggressive and is angry the whole time, right? It's hard, it's hard to deduce when they're really angry or when they're not, I mean, because it's just so aggressive. But if we remove those, those people for a second and we're focusing on really specifically like accommodators and analysts, an analyst will have a tendency to get heated up around a price point that makes absolutely no sense based on the data. And it'll be one of the few times that an analyst shows real anger and aggression in the negotiation. And so if you've pushed an analyst that far, a good follow-up label to that could simply be either it seems like I'm putting you in a bad spot or it sounds like, you know, go right, it sounds like that number is just, you know, excuse my language, right? Chaps your ass. And the reason why I use language like that is because if that's what fits for the context, use that when you're executing tactical empathy. If there's someone that likes to cuss or use metaphors and things of that nature, incorporate that into the way that you speak to them. On the accommodator side, the accommodator will get to a point where they are slowly withdrawing and you don't really understand why. And the reality is when they've gone to that point, they've decided that the relationship is ultimately fruitless because I'm gonna get bludgeon over the head, over the price point, and that leaves us in a really bad space as an entity. And so they don't have the, they, they're the type that don't really have um, a good sense of how to say no to people. And so they tend to just slowly withdraw more and more and more. And it's almost like uh, I, what I could compare it to is kind of like the end of a personal intimate relationship when things are going sideways and you haven't like officially broken up yet, but you like, you know, you text maybe sometimes, but then can't get them on the phone, right? Very similar to that, how an accommodator will start to slowly withdraw when you've pushed them too far. 